Welcome to Business of Being Black with Tammy Mack on Fox Soul. I am Tammy Mack. Hi there, everyone. So with the number of babies being put up for adoption on the decline and some estimates saying there are dozens of couples trying to adopt each each child, uh, what are the criteria for couples who want to adopt? It is legal for same-sex couples to adopt children in all 50 states, but at least nine states now have laws allowing for religious exemptions in the foster and adoption process. But why are people trying to prevent LGBTQIA couples from adopting? What's the controversy all about? Well, let's get down to business. The business of being black today is adoption in the LGBTQIA plus community. Please welcome activist and media personality, Jerome Tramiel. Hi, Jerome. Hi, thank you for having me. Author and activist, Hope Giselle. Hi, Hope. Hi, how are you doing? Great. The founder and president of the National African American Families First and Preservation Association, Latagia Copeland Tyrants. Hi, Latagia. How are you? Great. And the host of the Reality Check, Charles Butler, is with us today. What's up, Charles? I'm good. Good afternoon. Excellent. Let's start with the question that I always ask because I have to know why does it matter to our community? So why should black people care about adoption in the LGBTQ community? Latagia, let's kick it off with you. Oh, well, quite frankly, I don't, I don't care about someone's orientation. Um, my job and what I've been doing fighting all this time for is to limit adoption as much as possible, um, especially through child welfare. Um, I know there's different kinds of adoption. So that's another thing I kind of would need a little bit more information. I personally have been advocating for uh, family preservation at all costs, at, if at all possible. So you're, you're saying no adoption at all by anyone? Not a form, not in a formal sense. No, not black children. Not, not black, black children. children. Okay. Well, we'll circle back to that. Indeed. Charles, why, why should black people care? Well, I think we should care because, uh, you know, these are children, the, you know, it's, it's a new generation. Um, I, I happen to have interviewed over the years, uh, over the last, let's see, over the last, I was just thinking about this, over the last uh, 20 years, I've interviewed a number of, of uh, young people uh, who formed groups who were raised by same-sex couples who totally resented it. And uh, I listened to them. I don't know anything about it. Uh, I don't care about people's sexual orientation, but I do care about people trying to force their beliefs on me because I, I just don't believe, you know, it's like a, a, a drug addict. Uh, you know, I don't hate drug addicts. I don't discriminate against them, but at the same time, I don't want to be bothered. With them. So why should black people care about adoption in the LGBTQ community? Because so. it's about our future. It's about our children's future. Jerome, I'll ask the same question. Why should Black people care about adoption in the LGBTQIA plus community? Well, Black people should care about adoption in the LGBTQ community because we, uh, you know, are able to adopt children that have been neglected, abandoned, abused, um, not financially cared for. Rights have been taken away from some of these heterosexual couples. So they should be actually thanking us for having the ability to adopt in this community. And children deserve an environment where they're safe, they're sound, they're loved, they're protected, and they're nurtured. Hope, why should Black people care? I think first and foremost, just because people deserve the right, right, to live full and happy lives. And how does that happen if we're stuck in the system? I think that we all know that the system does not benefit Black folk in the same way that it benefits other people. And so therefore, the ability to adopt, especially when you're talking about being adopted into a family that is financially sound, that is, you know, stable, is a staple for all of us, not just Black LGBT people, but Black people as a whole. I don't think that someone's sexuality or gender expression should stop people from being able to give a home to a child that needs it. So let's go back to you, Latagia. When you say you don't believe that Black kids should be adopted, what does that mean? What exactly are you saying? What I mean, because now that I know that we're talking about specifically through the child welfare system and not uh, private adoption, um, having been a foster child myself, um, having had children that were in care, having had my rights unjustly terminated and my children, several of my children adopted out to white strangers, um, unjustly so, (laughs) I might add, uh, people underestimate how easy it is for that to happen. 
um, many times the parents and or family of the children are perfectly capable of taking care of those children. It just becomes a matter of policy, the matter of um, we got this family over here that wants these children and it's time to sabotage reunification. So I am fine with adoptions being, or, or I would say, like I like, I guess the better way of putting it is I'm fine with informal adoptions like the way things used to be when you know if if for instance a child really did um was going through some things and the parents or you know couldn't couldn't you know needed some help and you had um family family members or family friends that would just come come and um step forward and it would be something that would be privately it wouldn't be um including the child so welfare you're, you're okay for adoption in a private sense within that still that still remains within the family you're against adoption if it has to do with the government in any form yes or yes when, when it's when it's related to black children because i know what the system can and has and continues to do to our families it's not right right and we'll we, we certainly want to hear about your story but we'll come back to that uh charles according to the atlantic the percentage of never married women who give their infants up for adoption has dropped from 9% to less than 1% since the 1970s with fewer babies up for adoption than there were in the past what should the criteria be for couples who wish to adopt well well i think that the the criteria should be what it is for everyone else. I think they should be moral. I think they should be uh, loving. I think that uh, um, uh, these children need to be raised in a, in a, in a home that uh, allows them to um, thrive. Thrive, yeah. And, um, you know, I, I look at some of these situations, um, you know, people are trying to act like homosexuality is normal and it's accepted by everyone. Well, it's not. And uh, I think that, um, you know, the media may try to portray it that way. Uh, and, we, and we hear about this all the time now. And you, we've talked about this before, Tammy, uh, where, you know, every, every commercial, every other commercial has a, has a uh, multi-race uh, 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 family or you have gays or whatever. And, you know, I mean, society's just not like that. It's, you know, it, it, you know I, I don't know. It's, uh, it's a subject that, that's a slippery so when slope. You say, so Charles, when you say you, you're you for adoption as long as it's a loving family, a moral family, mm -hmm. by whose morals, who, who whose morals are we deciding? Well, I, you know, I'm a Christian. So, so I have Christian morals and Christian values, but I'm also a spiritual man. I've studied Judaism. I've studied Hinduism. I've studied Buddhism. I've studied some of the major religions. Uh, and they don't. The accept only reason I find that interesting, the only reason I find that interesting when you say I'm a Christian man, is because uh, there have been Christians who have babies out of wedlock, which mm -hmm. is uh, according to you, which would be morally uh, wrong, who mm -hmm. put their children up for adoption. Mm -hmm. So then, what do you say to that? Well, I say that that they made a choice, just like a choice about abortion and or not. They made a choice that someone else can do a better job of raising their child than they can. And they probably made the, made the best choice. Uh, you know, I don't think as, as uh, I'm sorry, uh, the, the young lady who was talking about adoptions Natasha. earlier, I don't think the government should be involved in this process. I think that, that those processes should be between a man, a woman, uh, their God, and um, you know, government needs to be out of that, that decision process totally. Wow. Yeah, I hope I see. I see you. I, I, girl, I, I see it. I see yeah, it. Because the idea that you all want to remove the government, but also give choice to people as they see fit. Should someone, you know, make the choice to give their children to a gay couple who has been good to them because they've realized that between them and their God, right, that these people uh, have the most loving capability for that child, why is that an issue? Also to say things like, oh, homosexuality, homosexuality isn't natural is once again another opinion, considering that we've seen multiple examples of the way that homosexuality shows up, not just in the human race, but even in the animal kingdom. That's not uh, true. That's an untrue are, statement. That is not a true statement. Are, these are things that are facts. They are that is not a true statement. Up. That um, is not a true statement at all. Institute. These are things that the Williams Institute, these are things that very notable. That is not a true statement at all. And I'm not going to let you get away with that. 
you don't have to let me get away with anything. The facts are the facts, and that's what it is. You that's not a fact. That's not a fact. In fact, it, 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 it's the way that the world shows up. And I'm sorry that you haven't adjusted to the fact that now there's new studies and people are not just allowing folks to be bigoted and, and have that be respected, right? People are combating those bigoted ideals with actual information, with actual numbers, with actual percentages, and not just your opinion and the thoughts well, and feelings the, the, of your the, Bible. The thoughts, so, the thoughts are your side and people like you. I, I always tell my friends to do one thing. And that's to go to a gay, a, go, a gay pride event. After you go, and when they go to a gay pride event, they come away with that loving, uh, normal, uh, all that stuff goes out the window. Uh, because, uh, you know, I, I mean, gays aren't, aren't new. Uh, Homosexuality is not new. Their behavior is not new. Uh, you know, we've been dealing with them since the beginning of time. And I know dealing that with, you've been I know dealing from a personal with- experience. And you, are you trying to say that homosexuality is acceptable? We had an act that was passed by the Congress, signed by President Clinton, called the Defense of Marriage Act. It was overturned by the Supreme Court. The American people said that marriage is between a man and a woman, Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. The American people also said that blacks should be segregated. The American people also said that you have to drink from a different water fountain. The American people also don't, said don't that- try to combine. Don't try to combine race and Hold homosexuality. That thought. We'll, we'll we'll bring it back around to adoption because this is uh, not in totality about uh, the moralistic values of uh, of your sexuality, but more so about adoption. So let's take a quick break. Come right back on business of being black. Welcome back to Business of Being Black with Tammy Mack. I'm Tammy Mack. And today, the business of being black is adoption in the LGBTQIA community. Before we left, I know Hope was saying or rather uh, debating Charles on uh, homosexuality being a natural process and uh, talked about how even animals uh, have same sex uh behavior, I guess you could call it. Well, Canadian biologist and author of the book, Biological Exuberance, Animal Homosexuality and Natural Diversity says that same-sex behavior, sexual pair bonding and parental activities has been documented on 450 species of animals worldwide. Uh, Jerome, I want to get into you. uh, I want to get to you on this. Does the controversy surrounding LGBTQ couples adopting children come from misinformation from people who are... um, I don't necessarily want to say anti, but don't have uh, that same belief. Well, Tammy, you don't have to say anti-LGBT or anti-queer, so I will. Yes, it comes from people, mostly straight people, who spread misinformation and they use things like their Bible to the brainwashing Bible to channel their homophobia. So let's talk about the Bible and let's talk about religion since Charles brought it up. So most of the children that are in adoption agencies and in foster care are children that are the result of heterosexual couples. Not just that, most of them are born out of wedlock. Not just that, let's talk about the Bible that prides marriage. When it comes to marriage, the straight couples divorce rate is 66 to 72% every single year, while the divorce rate for gay couples is 39 to 42% each year. So we talk about a solid foundation in a household where a child can be nurtured in an environment where they're safe and sound, you'll be more likely to put your child with a gay couple than a straight couple since they are so successful at having unsuccessful marriages. Uh, 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 Latagia, I'd like you to weigh yes. in on this. Like I said, I, I have no, for me, I'm, I'm going to keep this, the priority is keeping Black families together. That is what I do. That is what I have spent years doing. Um, it's about family preservation. And if you're going to go through the, the child welfare system, I really, I can't, I can't support that because Under, again, uh, well, let me put it this way, under very, under very specific circumstances, I could, I could understand um, adoption of any kind. Um, The, nobody in the family can get the child or wants the child, okay? Um, Nobody, the parents are deceased, you know, things of that nature. This is not, because I would say most, in fact, I know most of the children that are put up for adoption are what they call legal orphans, meaning their 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 parents' parental rights were just terminated for whatever. Um, and it's very, 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 very easy for that to happen. Um, you could jump through every hoop they ask you to j- jump through and still lose your parental rights, I know, because it happened to me. Um, you cannot have history of drug abuse, mental health issues, be a full-time student working. 
and you can still lose your children permanently and have your rights terminated. Um, and then place your children placed up for adoption. So for that, and to think about what happens after the fact, these children are also separated from each other, okay? Um, heterosexual- so I wanna go into your story a little bit because you say it, that you grew up in the foster care system. Oh, no, I didn't grow up. No, I, I spent time there. My mother was an uh, activist and this was in Minnesota in the early nineties. And um, a white woman called CPS on my mother when she found out that my mother was going to uh, the grocery store once a week. And my sister and I, I was six, my sister was one. And we were at home watching Little Mermaid for that hour and she called CPS and yeah, they came and took us away. Yeah. And so that's one of the reasons why you don't believe that the government should be involved in adoptions because uh, they mishandle these situations when exactly. it comes down. There's a lot, of, a lot of racism, a lot of white supremacy. The policies are basically um, I'm white and I say so, or I can do whatever I want. It literally takes one person, one person to say, oh, well, you're unfit and that's it. So the, it's, it's a very complex um, web that leads to these kind of injustices, but it's very, very common. Um, I would go so far as to say almost, I, like I said, most children, most children have at least one family member, one family friend, somebody that wants those children. And if the government allowed them to have those children, they would be with that person rather than be put up for adoption. And I think we've, we've seen that happen often in the black community where the grandmother is oftentimes the one who takes the child in. And then we watched a whole television show based on it with Bernie Mac, who took in uh, his nephews and, and nieces uh, because uh, his sister couldn't handle it. So I think that is common amongst the black community. But when it can't happen, I mean, can't we go outside? Jerome, in 2020, Tennessee Governor Bill Lee signed a measure into law uh, that would allow religious adoption agencies to deny service to same-sex couples. The reason cited for the law is religious freedom. Is it religious freedom or is it just discrimination? Is it a way of disguising discrimination? It's definitely discrimination. And, and speaking about religious, you know, entities, when it comes to the religious foster care and, re and religious based adoptions, they are the least successful. So maybe we should take religion out of it. And maybe you should ask your guide for some directions about how to make it more successful so you can match these children that need homes with parents. But I have to ask Latagia, um, outside of the injustice that happens in, in foster care and adoption, uh, this is the business of being black. Let's talk about black parents and let's talk about black children. Um, do you feel that gay couples or queer couples should be able to adopt children? I don't care. I, I mean, it, to me, the 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 sex uh, the sexual orientation is not the main issue. I I, I just. It's, yeah, I think it's Latagia, about, Latagia it's said not. earlier today. Uh, Latagia said earlier in the show that sexuality had nothing to do with it. She just prefer it not to be uh, uh, something that's mandated through the government or that the child doesn't have to go through the welfare system. Specifically, is what you said, right, Latagia? Exactly. Exactly. God, I just wanted a clear answer. Okay. Yeah. Um, have there been any cases of children being mistreated by their LGBTQ parents? Hope. Not that we can find, and that's the beautiful thing about um, the beautiful thing about this. We see more cases of children who are LGBT being beaten and killed, right, in situations where they have their birth parents who will find out their sexuality, discover, you know, that they're even thinking about it or hear rumors of it at school, or a, a teacher took it upon themselves to out this child, and now they go home to an environment where they are no longer safe. Now, in certain situations, it does not happen often. You will hear that there has been violence in the LGBT parent home, but that is those things are not things that you're going to hear as often as you hear it happen in, uh, in opposite sex mm. relations or in opposite sex homes. Charles, I hear you humming over there. Yes. Yes, weigh in, please. Um, well, I, you know, I, uh, uh, you know, when we when we talk about uh, you know, the violence at homes, the beatings at homes. The LGBT community is no different than, than the straight community. Uh, they're people. People are people. Uh, it's, just, it's just that, you know, they're sexual deviants in some people's opinion. Uh, bottom line is, I am very concerned about Black children being raised in queer environments uh, and being emasculated. At the end of the day, a Black man who's a queer is emasculated. He's not a man. <laughs> 
So, you know, they want to play this game, and, and especially liberals, they try to play this game and play off black folks. Uh, it's always black people. You know, uh, when you look at all the HIV commercials, uh, they're, they're, in, in the HIV community, uh, while we have a high infection of black folks, compared to white folks, is a very small number. But all the doggone commercials are with black people. It's it's as appalling to me that that we still have this racism going on, and they and they continue to put black folks out front in front of all these issues. It's voter suppression. It's black folks. Can I jump in real, real quick? This, com this, this comment about sexual demons that homosexuals are, let's talk about that. Let's dive into it. What a sexual demon is, an irresponsible parent that continuously have sex and adopt children that they don't want. What a sexual demon is, a child, as a person who has sex, have a baby, and abuse that baby and neglect that baby. I'm not a sexual demon. Now, I do do great things in the bedroom that is none of your business. I don't know why you're concerned about it, but, you know, I, maybe I can teach you I'm not things. concerned I'm about confused. it. I, I'm, I'm only confused. I'm only confused. I'm only concerned about. How do you know what? How do you I'm know that you're concerned about? How do you know what goes on? How do you know what goes on in the I'm only concerned about. How do you know what goes on in the bedroom between I'm only concerned about it. How do you know children are involved? Are you concerned? And I don't think that. I don't think that any child should be what exposed a homosexual to the queer. I don't think that any do, child should be what exposed. What does homosexual have to do with parenting? homosexuals? What does homosexual have to do with parenting? Let's take a quick break. I'm just saying what I said. Welcome back to Business of Being Black with Tammy Mack. I'm Tammy Mack. Let's get down to business. The business of being black today is adoption in the LGBTQIA plus community. Please welcome activist and media personality, Jerome Tramiel, author and activist, Hope Giselle, the founder and president of the National African-American Families First and Preser Pre Preservation Association, Latagia Copeland Tyrants, and the host of The Reality Check, Charles Butler. Charles, um, I want to go to you here. Uh, why do some people believe that it is impossible for LGBTQ couples to provide a loving home for children if given the opportunity? I don't think that you can say that across the board about uh, LGBT uh, couples. I would never say that about LGBT couples. I just don't, uh, I just don't appreciate the lifestyle myself. So whether or not, you know, they have loving relationships just like everyone else. I've stated that. Uh, they have their, they're, they get divorced just like straight couples. You know, the bottom line, but at, at the end of the day, I would not want a child, uh, a child uh, raised in that queer environment, bottom line. Whether it's two women or two men, doesn't make any difference to me. And, and, and this is the other thing, Tammy, as I said to you before, there are a number of groups out there, uh, support groups of children who were raised by same-sex couples, uh, and they are all messed up psychologically. And uh, so I'm just, you know, for me, like I said, I don't, I wouldn't get involved in it because I'm, I'm just not going to do that. Um, I don't, I'm not sure that we've lived a, a long enough cycle because let's keep in mind that uh, same sex couples have just recently been allowed to adopt. Exactly. So I'm not exactly. sure that there is, there's been a cycle of life yet to where we can see effects of those children that they've adopted as adults. So well, where no, these, where these, these young people that I talked to were that's adults. Cool. They were in their 20s. That, but that's exactly the where we're wrong. Latagia has talked about informal adoptions. And L LGBT folks and queer people have been informally adopting children since ballroom started, since before ballroom, and since we've had this whole uproar of people within, especially the Black community, mm -hmm. you know, adopting into Christianity mm -hmm. at the forefront of why, that's right? True. They know want people to you know have children or be a part of the conversation so when mm -hmm. we talk about the idea that we don't have the numbers and we're not seeing the fruit we've seen it every mm -hmm. single time children are thrown out on the streets because they are queer because they are gay because they're lesbian mm -hmm. or trans mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. lgbt elders come and pick them up mm -hmm. we've seen the fruits of their labor we've seen mm -hmm. the Crosses. We've seen the India Moors. We've seen mm -hmm. the Janet Fox. We've seen the fruits of LGBT people informally adopting. Mm -hmm. And let's be honest, as we're looking at it, these folks are shiny and growing and living their best lives and also contributing to what it means to be Black and in culture on a daily basis. Yeah. And, um, you also, and you speak to uh, informal adoption. So yes, I was speaking of uh, the more formal adoption when I said that. But yes, you're absolutely right in that sense, Hope. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Jer Jerome, did you, did you want to weigh in? 
Yes, because I know he said that he don't care if it's two women or two men. Like, he just doesn't, you know, like the lifestyle or whatever. But my whole thing is if the child is in a loving, nurturing environment and they're safe and sound, what does their lifestyle, because I'm using your word, have to do with parenting? They're queer. And so, so, so the fact that I have to even go into that with you tells me that we would never, we would never find common ground. No, uh, you're, you're, no, is, you're going into it with everyone who is watching. Loving, what is wrong with queer parents? Parents, I'm, I, you have they're queer. Any, they're queer. What is wrong? <laughs> so what is wrong they're with queer. that? I'm looking for right. What is wrong what with is, that? You, you, they're queer. You, you, you hold. Well, are you saying? Are you suggesting though, Charles, that it's moralistically wrong, and that's why it's uh, it's totally moralistically wrong. I'm asking why. I mean, he hosts a platform called Reality. What do you mean why? Did you, did, why? Were you raised in a church, young man? <laughs> I was raised in a church. Actually. Well, good. The same church that be the same church that be Ooh. sitting there giving their way their kids because they don't want to raise them financially or abuse oh, them or neglect true. them. The same oh, church. That's not true. I mean, I mean, life is life, and I'm, I'm not going to make any gross exaggerations. It, about it sounds like excuses. I, I, I'm not making gross exaggerations about anything, and that's why. Upon getting here, the that's same why, Tammy. I'm serious. I, Played black folks upon getting to these Americas. The same folks that used God and told you that you were supposed to be an indentured Here slave. Here we go, back to slavery. Let's, <laughs> talk, same, let's talk 2022, that baby. Book, that same book right there. Let's that talk one. 2022, okay? So, Jerome, you exactly. were asking, Jerome, you were asking Charles why, why, why? And Charles' answer is he believes it's morally wrong and he doesn't agree with, uh, with, with queerness. So, and I, so, and so I heard people, that, I'm just... I so, heard that, and I'm just thinking that maybe if he was raised by gay parents, then he'll be a little bit more intelligent, open-minded. That's it. I, I'm a, I'm very intelligent, by the way, and I'm very moralistic. I, I don't I want the smell. I don't want the smell of excrement on my body when I can have the smell of a sweet woman on my body. Do you? How about that? Unfortunate for her. Oh. <laughs> Jerome, um, Jerome, I, I would like to say something. Yeah, Taji, go right in. Yes. Um, like I said, I don't mind I, that again what people do in the bedroom has nothing to do with me i don't that's exactly my, my thing i don't care I, like i said it's about family preservation again if it's going to be a lgbtq parent adopt within the family informally or what have you or if, again under very limited circumstances they need to adopt a family member i don't care my nephew who is lgbt um tried to get one of my children when i was fighting the state to get and he jumped through every hoop and had no problem. There was nothing, nothing. And they denied him. They would mm -hmm. rather give my baby to a white stranger than to give him to his LGBT cousin. And this uh, should be more, this should be more of the conversation that we're having. Considering now, I don't know if that had anything to do with it or not, but I would, I didn't want, it shouldn't have happened at all. But if my child was going to be removed, I would, I wanted him to be with his family. So Natasha, why were you considered an unfit parent? I was a non-offending parent. So when I was at school and work, some things were going on in my home with their father and I didn't know. And uh, that's basically it. They also used the, the history of me being in foster care myself against me. So, it, so it's, let me, oh. I'm sorry, go ahead. It's I was going to say this. What, because... Uh, it, why the question is, and Charles, I'll go to you on this. I mean, if she would have wanted her family, her kids to be with a family member versus some other woman from some other uh, ethnicity uh, to take her child, do you see that as fair? Yeah, no, I don't. I think that she should have, that that the young man who tried to adopt her, her son or her child should have had her child. I mean, that's a family member. But Someone she trusted. But he's so gay. There, there, there are some, there are, in, there are some instances that you're okay with. Oh, it. no question. Yeah. I mean, the, that, that particular situation that we're talking about, I mean, she would know where her child was. She'd have access to her child. Uh, he was, he, he or she was with a family member. What's wrong with that? The fact that the guy's gay or not, like I said, doesn't matter to me. Jerome, I want to talk about this because this is oftentimes this uh, the stereotype that adopting uh, children get when we talk about the gay community, um, and that's being unfairly associating uh, associated with pedophilia and sexual assault. 
Uh, Latagia just brought up a case, uh, just brought up that something was going on in her home with the father of the children. And a lot of times that people, people's argument is that this is what goes on in the gay community. So speak to that, please. Yes. And I absolutely can speak to that. So um, before I got in the entertainment industry, I actually was a teacher, uh, preschool mainly for five years. And being a preschool teacher, I've had parents that ask me, like, why are you teaching little kids? Um, are you a pedophile? Do you like touching on little kids? They automatically link homosexuality with being a pedophile, with being a child molester. And again, that goes back to that misinformation that is being spread and that brainwashing Bible that they use. So even in the adoption agency process where I started in Wisconsin, started in Georgia, I seen the discriminatory uh, uh, stances and issues that I faced even with adopting, even as a, you know, uh, a parent by myself, a solo parent. So yes, it's, it's a thing and out there and it's real that they really link us with being a pedophile when stats show that most times when children are molested, when pedophile is, a, a, is, you know, an issue, it's by, you know, cisgender straight people, men and women. Hope. I think that we all can bet our bottom dollar on the fact that there are not a bunch of LGBT people who have a bunch of other intersections to worry about around her raping kids. I think that when we talk about this topic, it's a lot easier for folks to believe that we are deviants and that we have these sexual desires that are beyond reproach or... or, or um, I thought we're going to go to commercial cons- break. Welcome back to Business of Being Black with Tammy Mack. I am Tammy Mack. And the Business of Being Black today is adoption within the LGBTQIA plus community. So Jay-Z reportedly recorded the song Smile one day after his mother came out as gay in 2017. He said he cried after he realized she had to hide her sexuality for so long. If Jay-Z is successful after being raised by a closeted gay mother, couldn't he have been just as successful if his mother had a same-sex partner who could have helped to co-parent him, possibly, Charles? Well, I I just I just go back to uh, I don't know how many of you've read um, 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 Adam Clayton Powell Sr.'s biography. Uh, Homosexuality was rampant during the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, uh, Adam Clayton Powell Sr. led the rebellion that cleaned they cleaned up the homosexuality that was in Harlem. So, like I said before, this whole homosexuality in the black community among black artists, uh, you know, Jay Z was raised in a in a decadent environment. Uh, I don't put a lot, you know, everybody, you know, they defer to these people like like they're geniuses when the white man built them up. The white man you know, distributes their music and and and, and position them where they're in. Jay-Z, as you remember right, Tammy, Jay-Z was on trial for murder, okay? So, and these are the kind of people that they hold out there for us to, uh, to embrace and to embellish because these white boys have made them millionaires and billionaires. Well, I don't know that Jay-Z was uplifted by the white community necessarily. He seemed to have come through the trenches of his own uh, on on his own. All his music, all of that music is is distributed and made by white folks. Jay-Z's brand is a white is a white is, is, is all white folks. All, all, I mean, I know the history of him, Puffy. Puffy doesn't even run his own company. The guy who runs Puffy's I'm not company. I'm talking about Puffy. I'm talking about Jay-Z. I, well, let's talk about Jay-Z. He's in the same boat. All of them are. They're bought and paid for by white Jews. Jerome? I'm wondering what does that have to do with him being raised by a queer parent and how do we get that answer? Well, you know, but his his pet she was was she a drug addict, uh, Tammy? She did have a battle with drugs. She, she did have a battle with drugs. She okay. Didn't. So, you know, I mean that I mean that says it all. That's who she is. Who, who cares? That doesn't I mean, say we, that. We, <laughs> see, that's the other thing. The question on board is, do you think Jay-Z would have been as successful if she would have had a, a co-parenting situation? With I, a- I, no, I don't think so at all. It didn't make any difference. It didn't make any difference. And, like with any of those rappers. I oh. mean, you know, and, and I love Tupac. And, you know, his mama wasn't no drug addict. Well, uh, I'm... Yeah. Got that? Uh, you're avoiding the question. Of, of, uh, Go ahead. 
is there, there's a need to discredit the ideas that queer people can contribute positively towards the Black community. And I think that that's a huge part of, of, of the issue when we talk about the adoption of children, especially as we're talking about the adoption of Black children by Black queer people, is the Black community's overall outlook to make sure that folks do not believe that Black queer people contribute positively to the community while still using and abusing a lot of the things that help the Black community to flourish, right? Our lingo, the clothing, the way that we come up in media and conversations, all of these things are super positive. But when it comes time to give accolades or express um, admiration or thank you for those things, the Black community is like, yeah, and, right? But as long as it's happening behind the scenes and nobody knows that there is this queer machine that is pushing forth, you know, this, this cishet voice, then it's okay. And I think that that's a lot of what's happening here, especially as it pertains to Charles's, um, you know, rebuttals, is that they are off base and they don't have any other um, standpoint than this underlined issue of, I don't like y'all, and so therefore it's okay. And no, I, wish no, I, I just it, talked about the Highland Renaissance. Look at all the queer people in the Highland Renaissance, girl. But even, you, I mean, but, do your homework. Do your homework. Of, even I as just told you about, about the Harlem Renaissance, it was full of homosexuals. Black, you, even as you spoke about that, you failed it to realize that it was full of queers about the violence that was used to get these folks out of the New York. You spoke they, about they, they did. They, they spoke put them back the in the closet. Hold oh, that thought, Charles. Let her complete her thought. Go ahead, Hope. I, I, it's one of those things where it's like you don't realize that you're speaking about a violent uprising that was used to get LGBT people to once again either closet themselves or believe, right, for the for the sake of existing and being safe, that they were no longer queer. There you you're go using terminology that's, that, that doesn't that, that, that's not applicable to the situation. Situation. Who said anything about violence? It doesn't have to be said. It's implied. You said it. Now, now you see, again, embellishing black and lying. People. That's what you guys black do. Myself. You embellish and you lie. It's not a lie. It's it not a lie. lie. It's experience. Your experience was that, oh, it was a push to get the LGBT people out. My experience was that you took LGBT people and forcefully asked them to not show up to spaces. And in a lot of spaces, they were beaten. This is documented. This That's is the Stonewall riots. This is Marsha P. Johnson. This is Stormy. This is all of the black and brown people of oh, color please. that had fight during the Harlem Renaissance to it in, in order to be seen. And the idea that you're trying to cloak the fact that they were beaten out of spaces with this idea of, oh, they were they were sexual deviants. Say what it was. Don't be a wolf in sheep's clothing. They were say sexual that. deviants. No, I'm you know, a real wolf. I'm not, in, I'm, not in, I'm not a sheep. Say that. I'm a real wolf. Say Let's that. <laughs> and, I, and so am I. The bite is just as Well, we'll see. <laughs> we will. And I would like, I would just like to add that I don't want anyone to walk away with this conversation and think that like we are against like straight people. Uh, you know, raising kids or adopting kids. But I also want to provide this um, scenario that like, even with, you know, cis and straight people as, as being parents, whether they have queer kids or not, just, just to reverse it a little bit, you have parents who are like Boosie, who are negative, who abuse his kids, who is homophobic. And then you have parents like Gabrielle Union and Dwayne Wade, who uh, nurture and provide and support and educate themselves on with parenting is so just like you have that for you know straight couples you have that for queer parents as well so I that just, boy needs a, that boy that boy needs a psychiatrist that young, that young what woman that, what boy? that lady yes her what, what boy? that boy needs a psychiatrist that young woman yes no, that I, young boy that needs young, a psychiatrist uh well let me finish my well, well let me just go finish, ahead, Jerome. Go let ahead. Me finish with this uh zaya way does not need a psychiatrist i do know who needs one though and they're sitting on this panel <laughs> Some boys struggle when they grow up without a father because they don't have any male role models. Would that also be the case for boy, boys who are raised by two mothers? Do you think? Uh, Latagia, let's jump in on this. I'm sorry. Say, when, Some, some boys struggle when they grow up without a father because they don't have any male role models. Would that also be the case for boys who are raised by two mothers? I would assume so, yes. Yeah, I would assume that, yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, also I, the same case for a boy that's raised by a single mother? Yeah. I was gonna say, <laughs> oh, so. <laughs> yeah. Any boy involved? that needs, uh, every boy needs a male influence in his life. True. It, it, Do, does he? That's true. Well, let me say. So. Well, let me say. This well, is the, uh, is, there are women yeah, who are go through this, right? Like, why are we always talking about the young boys? This this is another problem. I was that going, I, I was going to say the same thing about, about girls. 
after. No, no, no. I what you're thing. saying, but what I'm saying is that even in the questioning, when we have these conversations at large, we're never talking about the the issues that the young lesbian women face, especially within the Black community. We're never talking about the issues of what happens when a mother leaves the situation and has to be raised by the father, right? Those things are always left to the, the wayside. Those women are never given voice to talk about their experiences. Mm -hmm. But the second that a person assumes that their son is going to be a sissy, it's always this huge, large conversation. And there's always a need to want to blame Black Black women. Why is there this idea that if a man walks away from the situation, that a black woman is to blame for whatever happens and putting this pressure, this immense pressure on black mothers to either harden themselves or find someone that may be toxic for their family and them as a whole in order to prove that their son isn't going to grow up a sissy. There are plenty of people that have grown up, been raised by black women, and it's been okay. There are plenty of folks that we don't know about their personal life that have been raised by LGBT folks and refuse to admit that because of the stigma. And so I think that we need to move away from this conversation around centering young black boys as if there's a, a sole goal every time somebody wakes up in America it's oh let me emasculate them what about these young lesbian women who do not have a voice at all to talk about their experience within the black household because young lesbian girls are being beaten by their mothers every single day, being beaten by their fathers, having people in their family molest them to try to get the gay out of them because all you need is the right one. And that is a conversation that we're not having. This idea that Black masculinity is up for sale is only in the minds of immature women and emasculated Black men who are already done the work for themselves. The, the world doesn't have to do that to you. The white man doesn't have to do that to you. You woke up this morning and you felt inferior and so you were inferior and that is your problem, not the problem of Black women who who happen to end up in a situation alone. Let's take a quick, quick commercial break. Welcome back to Business of Being Black with Tammy Mack. I am Tammy Mack in the Business of Being Black today, adoption in the LGBTQIA plus community. Jerome, as a member of the LGBTQ community who is attempting to adopt a child, can you tell us a little bit about that experience? Yes. So I started in Wisconsin. I also had the experience in Georgia. So um, first of all, like taking the classes and um, just even being able to qualify like certain income, certain housing situations, clean background checks and things of that nature, like all that's been positive, all that has been um, quite easy. But going inside uh, and doing certain interviews and certain classes, um, you get the questions from either the facilitators and instructors or even from some of the participants and, you know, and, and clients who are asking like, oh, why do you want to adopt? Like, you don't have a girlfriend or you don't have a partner and stuff like that. So um, I've been facing a little bit of uh, a little of some some issues where I'm just asking why. If, it's, if I'm going to be in a situation where I'm going to adopt a child who's going to have a loving environment, taken care of, safe and sound, why does it matter what my sexual orientation is, if I have a partner or not? None of that matters. What matters is me adopting a child that heterosexuals refuse to take care of appropriately. Yeah, um, it's interesting. You, you're you kind of working with two things against you here because it's always been an, an issue for single women to adopt, right? Um, I think America has kind of gotten over that a little bit. And so now we're into LGBTQ community not being able to adopt as easily is what I'm suggesting. And uh, being single and a part of uh, the community, uh, it, it would seem to have taken you through several hoops. What are some of the most offensive questions that you've been asked? Um, so mostly it's been questions from the other people who are attending the class and they're just like, um, like, I'm not specifically what's your motive uh, for wanting to adopt, but it's like, how do you know that you can raise a child? And um, like I said, like, uh, do you have a partner? Um, you, you don't want to have a wife and the things of that nature. So those are kind of the comments and questions I get, which I really just, you know, it's just like, it furious me a little bit, but, you know, I just, you know, I deal with it. Tell us about the SIP. Yes, so Jerome the Sip is a celebrity entertainment news platform and a weekly talk show that is coming soon in the summer. So I'm happy to um, uh, launch this. It's gonna be a splash. And be a splash. Is it a yes. splash or a sip? Oh, come on now, <laughs> Latagia. Uh, tell us about NAFPA. Is that NAFPA? Yes, it's um. I founded it in 2019. It's the only. The only 501c4 political organization to specifically um, devoted specifically to uh, protecting uh, 
Black families and Black children and family preservation in the country. I did that because of my own personal, um, uh, what I went through personally, and there was no help. I could find no help from no one. Um, so I decided to create this organization to be there and be a resource for people that are going through, and there's a lot of us going through CPS, and um, just be there um, to provide support. I do one-on-one -on -one with parents. Um, I don't charge them anything. I also do a lot of policy lobbying um, for the African-American Child Welfare Act that will give us the same, similar, or very similar um, protections that Native Americans have. Um, I also advocate for the re repeal of ASFA, the Adoptions and, S Adoptions and Safe Families Act um, of 1997, which makes it um, very, very easy to have your rights terminated. And when you have a bunch of rights have been terminated, they can come and confiscate your child, um, any future children, no matter what the situation is until the end of time. So among other things. So I advocate for that to be repealed. Um, and yeah, so I do a lot of policy, a lot of um, policy advocacy, specifically for ever, Black families. Did you ever get your children back? No. I'm sorry to hear that. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, I, I'm hoping that you get a chance to see them, though. Well, they, you know, that <laughs> no. I mean, I have contact with a few of my children that are still in the system. The children that have been adopted out, again, they've been adopted out by two white families. They know where I'm at. I mean, no, no, no. Um, Cut off all content. Charles, remind us when and where we can catch the reality check. Tell us a little bit about that. Oh well, we're on hiatus right now because we're we're starting a new TV program. I can tell. I, I, I can tell you the title of the program is called Just the Facts. Uh, but I'm on hiatus right now. I'm gonna start back at uh, BlackandWhite.us uh, the first uh, July first. But uh, I can tell you. Uh, this whole process about adoptions, whether it's a straight couple, LGBT couple, white couple, you know, a lot of my my, my friends who are professionals uh, found it easier to adopt uh, Chinese babies and Russian babies than an American baby. And I'm going, well, you know, and I asked them, well, why would you adopt a Chinese baby? They said, it was just easier. Why you why you adopt this Russian baby? It was easier. I tried to adopt an American baby. So, you know, there's a lot going on with this system that's broken. Um, and, uh, you know, to, to, to everyone on, on the panel today, I appreciate your perspectives uh, and, and enjoyed them immensely. Um, you know, love is love uh, when you're talking about children. And, and, and I just don't want to see any child abused or hurt uh, in any way uh, be, be, uh, because of something they didn't do. So. Um, at some point in this in this in this thing we call life or the world, uh, we're going to have to get back to uh, loving each other and looking after each other, and uh, all the, the the race, the sexual orientation, all of that stuff has to go away. And people are people. As far as Charles, I, I can't tell you how appreciative I am of that comment. Thank you so very much. To to, to wrap my show up with some love. I like, <laughs> Hope, Hope, what can you tell us about your books with an S, Becoming Hope and Until I Met Black Men? Uh, so Becoming Hope is what I like to call my manifesto. It's a biography that I wrote for people who want to know like the beginning of it. When we have these trans experiences, a lot of people start at the glory. It's like, oh, I woke up and I was beautiful, right? Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about what it was to have my father and my grandfather and to have men and to have like this, this, this upbringing that felt really black and really authentic, but still, you know, struggle with the idea of being able to be myself. And then Until I Met Black Men uh, is a long form response to people telling me that because there wasn't a man in the home or because I didn't have a good experience with men, this is why I show up the way that I show up in the world. And that's entirely untrue. I've had some amazing relationships with Black men. I've had some horrible relationships with Black men. I've had platonic and, and loving relationships. And through all of those things, right, I would not be the woman that I am today without those relationships to them. And it's a really good read about the dissection of interacting with Black men while being queer and Black at the same time. 
Um, Charles, I want to end on something you said, and that's about love. How do we love? How do, in one word, everybody, um, I, I want to answer Charles' question. Um, how can we get back to a society that's full of love? Jerome? Oh, can I say two words? Yes, go ahead. Um, embrace the deviance. <laughs> okay. Charles? <laughs> that ain't happening. You get two words, Charles. How do we come back to love? Um, God. God and Jesus Christ. All right. Hope, what you got? Empathy. Empathy? That's it. Empathy. And minding your own business. It's just that. Lat <laughs> Latagia? Black first. Black first. Ah, uh, Okay. Thank you all for being on Business of Being Black with Tammy Mack. <laughs> Until next time.